So if you don't remember way back when, um, the last time we met as a class, um, we talked about doing a seminar kind of thing. And so Matt kindly volunteered to be the first victim. Um, and so he's come up with a, uh, um, a very, uh, very nice essay, um, which uh, I think you'll find to be uh, very interesting. And it, uh, what it does is it presents the history um, of Protestants, Protestantism's interaction uh, in America, uh, especially in the colonial period, um, and then going into into the 19th century. So, um, with that, you're on. All right. So, yeah. So, we're going through Rock and Sand, we've been discussing the different reformers and talking about you know their different approaches um, and how they've gone. They went into schism, but um, immediately after this whole Protestant Reformation, essentially continental Europe went into um, math, like the Thirty Years' War, it's called, but it was actually longer than that. But this big um, conflict between the Lutherans primarily and the Catholics, vying for territory and you know basically trying to claim their their portion of land for their religious group. So. Um, it was quite bloody. I think around eight million people died from this conflict, which was very large for that that period of time, the population. Um, so it was it was pretty bloody. And uh, one of the interesting things, actually, that I found out today was that um, even though the, the Calvinists were around, uh, they were not part of. Uh, they were they were not largely part of this conflict because both the Catholics and the Lutherans agreed that they shouldn't have any territory. So. Um, I think that what that leads to is that the, the Calvinists that existed kind of in the, in the Swiss, modern day Swiss, France, and Netherlands territory kind of were looking for a place to set up shop. And so, um, so this paper kind of starts with that context of the Thirty Years' War happening in Europe at the time and <clears throat> what eventually came to be called the Treaty of Westphalia, which was basically establishing that um, whoever was the ruler in their province could basically dictate what religion should be there. So that kind of led to this whole transformation from like the imperial model of governing to a nation state model where there were sovereign territories that became nation states. And so that was, that was largely born out of the Thirty Years' War and, and establishing state churches in, in that area in continental Europe. So we had you know, the Anglican church in, in England, we had the Lutheran church set up in Germany and then the, the Scandinavian countries, um, and then Catholicism elsewhere. So um, the poor Calvinists didn't really have any, any place to go, so, so they came to America. Um, now, it's interesting because the original 13 colonies, they were all, Different. They had unique characteristics, and so it wasn't just the, the Calvinists, but lar in large part, initially it was the, the a lot of the Calvinist influence who became Puritans in the Northeast, and then you had a lot of the Anglicans who settled initially in Virginia, but in in the broader Southern colonies. Um, so that those were the two major major influences initially. And so immediately, you know, when I was when I was taught U.S. history, I was I was told like the Pilgrims came over, they were looking for religious freedom because they were persecuted from the Church of England, and so they settled down and and started a, a country of religious freedom. But that's a really simplistic simplistic version because there was a lot of conflict and a lot of tension between the interactions of all these religious groups. Um, that then just fractured from there. And so we saw not just Puritans and Anglicans, but they fractured into, you know, the Anabaptists and, you know, all of the other sects that came after that. Um, and so, uh, like I said, each, each colony had kind of its unique interaction and history um, that kind of reflected in a sense like what was happening in Europe because Europe had, of course, the... the bloody wars that led up to the Treaty of Westphalia, which was supposed to be a, a basically a peace treaty. Um, and so in a, in a similar kind of parallel sense, like the early American colonies also experienced a lot of uh, turbulent uh, 
conflict between the religious groups that eventually led to this idea of you know religious freedom from from basically the established churches at the time. Um, so initially, the the Puritans set up uh, Congregationalism as the official s state church in the northern colonies, and so you know anyone who basically opposed that that worldview was kicked out, and so that was already starting to take place in the early 1600s. Um, so I list here in the, in the beginning of the second paragraph, the antinomian controversy. So among other things um, that were happening, basically there was this woman named Anne Hutchinson, which maybe you've heard of. Um, she's a controversial figure because some people put her in a positive light, some people don't. But basically she was challenging the, the orthodoxy of the Puritan church. Um, in Massachusetts, in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And of course, like the, the state church didn't really um, take kindly to that. So she was, she was tried for heresy and sedition basically for um, subverting essentially the, the um, congregational church. And so this, um, this led to her and a bunch of people from the Massachusetts Bay Colony migrating over to what became the Rhode Island colony, which established primarily as, as a religious freedom haven. Um, so you had, you had her as well as this gentleman named um, Roger Williams, who founded Rhode Island essentially on the premise of, of having religious freedom because they didn't agree with having a state church in, in Massachusetts. So they believed that they could still basically, because I think the mindset at the time correct me, Veronica, was that religion was a, was a primary ingredient to having a, a, a unified uh, society. And so this idea that um, you know, people could believe whatever they wanted according to their individual conscience was pretty radical at the time. And there had already been hints at people discussing these things, but um, Roger Williams in particular took this in a very intellectual way and really developed this idea of like, how do you build a society without having like any religion, uh, like public religion to conform to. Um, he very much advocated for um, individual conscience. And um, he, and so he wrote, he wrote this book um, called the, the Bloody Tenant of Persecution for Cause of Conscience. And basically, it was this dialogue of truth and peace, and how do you reconcile the two? Because obviously, all these religious groups were claiming to promote their truth and to, to guard it and to protect it, but at the same time, it's led to a lot of conflict uh, when you had varying, varying groups uh, struggling for basically political power. Um, so one thing that I found interesting was that he was very much opposed to the Constantinian model. Like He did not like Constantine at all. Um, because he felt that Constantine essentially was was someone who established Christianity as the as the religion that people should follow, and that somehow this caused this, this forced people to conform their their views to to a, a standardized religion. Um, Good question. So I know there's a the idea of separation of church and state, but was it like still held within the conscious of like the that they wanted a unity between church and state, or was like everybody on board like, yeah, just separate the two? That's a, that's a much later concept. There was no concept of separation of church and state. This is the beginning of it. Yeah. So, so basically, from, from what I had mentioned initially from um, the, the nation states, that's what basically led to this idea of, of in the West, the Western model of church, church a state having an official church. And so that was the norm, um, even going into the colonies. So everybody just assumed, like, oh, you need a you need a state religion. Um, and essentially, what that meant was that taxes were given f to further the efforts of that church. So taxes were given to build churches and basically um, promote that particular church in that society. Um, what the colonies had as well is, that, is they had laws like anti-blasphemy laws. They had laws that if you didn't adhere to this particular like, doctrine of 
Puritanism or whatever. Um, you could go practice your religion off, off somewhere else, but you, you couldn't have any political office. So I think like this, the notion of separation of church and state wasn't a thing yet. And it was very much tied to like public office. Because um, if you didn't adhere to that particular Christian denomination, you, you couldn't serve in like government. If, if I may, yeah. um, these you know these are some of the foundational ideas of uh, that developed into into um, our Constitution and, and Bill of Rights, but um, these are completely alien to Christianity from before the Reformation, even until a hundred years after the Reformation, um, because uh, there was no concept whatsoever of the separation of the church and the state and. Um, of the society, religion was always a public matter, and it was all, and religion was all about public activity. There was no such thing as freedom of conscience. It was it was not that was not um, that was not thought of. Um, uh, so what 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 this is? This is a radical cultural shift. Um, to individualism as opposed to a kind of uh, collectivism, a kind of a, a corporate idea of, uh, of, of, of a unified church, which is also, um, which has governance, faction, governance functions, which has um, the function of, of holding the society together through public rituals, through public expression of the faith, you know, Religion is always a public thing. Um, and I would submit to you that orthodoxy is the old style, not the new style. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that later. Yeah, because one of the things I was interested in was like this democratic system with religious liberty as its, as its core in the First Amendment. Like, is this just a cultural thing or is this actually a shift in paradigm from, from an old world way of doing things. And it really was a radical shift. Like there was no concept of any of this at the time. Um, and later on, like as, uh, later on it was really James Madison and Thomas Jefferson that, that crafted the, the, um, the First Amendment with the religious clauses. And like James Madison asked like, can we even have a society without a, an official re religion? Like he didn't even know if that was possible. Um, that's how that's how radical a shift that was. So, um, <clears throat> so there's the antinomian controversy, and then later on, much later on, was the um, Salem witch trials that took place. You know, that was that was a whole ordeal that you know had religious overtones and you know was shrouded in mystery and bizarre in and of itself. Um, that was Massachusetts, um, Rhode Island. We discussed just now. Um, that it was really the first place, I mean, society, at least in the civilized world that we know of, I guess, that um, established this society based on the principles of religious liberty and everybody's right to their own practice and belief. Um, and so, um, in particular, it was, it was that giving people the freedom not to conform to the the liturgy and the services of the, of, or any promotion of the um, Church of England. And then it's also interesting to note that Roger Williams, in addition to founding Rhode Island based on these principles, was also his own founder of the First Baptist Church in America, too. So, of course, the Baptist Church is very prominent throughout the U.S. Um, he was the founder of that church. Is there a certain like? Is there a hierarchy within the Baptist Church? Because it seems like it's all pretty loose, and anyone could just gonna kind of say they're a Baptist Church. No, there's a, there's no hierarchy. I would say it's more of a spiritual movement than a, a church. That's what I was thinking. Because I was like, is there really an organi organization behind it? Is well, there is. A, there are organizations, but um, but it's not a hierarchy in the sense of the of like the Orthodox Church. It is in some ways a really radical development, right? I'm sorry. Untethering of religious from uh, the religion from civilization because uh, 
that wasn't that responsible for structuring civilization? Right, the religion is what structured right. structured society. Interestingly, he's my ancestor. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> my son was named so Daniel. it's your fault. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My parents, my parents love the guy. They just went up to uh, last year. They went to Rhode Island to like, a, you know, um, explore the the history of Robin Williams. Dang, that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> well, it seems it seems like a lot of like the history books and stuff put him in a very positive light because he was yeah. he was wow. really the the main force behind like what would become. Um, freedom of, of religious exercise as well as having an established church. So I think like coming from an orthodox perspective too, I mean, there, there was a shift also um, in American history where you went from like tolerating other sects to actually having complete neutrality. And that was also, also a much different thing too. Because um, initially, you know, you had other groups and you they pass toleration acts to where you know you're not like persecuting them or anything, but you're you're allowing them to do their thing. Um, but the the state is still promoting like congregationalism or Anglicanism or something like that. Yeah. But then, but then beyond that, um, then it transforms almost to this um, like th there's no there's no involvement from from the state into any form of religion whatsoever. So well, state just become the sort of structuring system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. A, se a secular, yeah. a secular approach. But I mean, I think, I think as we've we've seen over the past couple hundred years, now there's this kind of secular morality that takes over because Christianity is not the the dominant force, and so now the state becomes that that religious provider, even though they attempted not to have it, but. It's kind of inevitable, right? Yeah, well, you think about it. You know, there, there are civic rituals. No. You know, there are saints. <laughs> you know, there are feast days. No. Um, <laughs> you know, there are icons. The whole religious syntax yeah. is still there, yeah. Yeah, I yeah. mean, and, and that civil religion, yeah. you know, has become, you yeah. know, the uh, dominant. Now, in, in other words, the state becomes God. Yeah, the whole and, and that is, and that is, that is one of the one of the, the that is the core issue that we're facing right now. Right, and that sort of heightens political discourse too. Right, right. And it's it's everything. But what, what is the language about the capital, the, the sacred temple of democracy? Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's everywhere. Right. Yeah. Uh, I would I would submit that the founders intended it that way. Um, they did. Yeah. Even with that sort of you know neoclassical architecture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the iconography and the, the tundra. Yeah. And, and to this day, I think a, a lot of people, uh, evangelicals even, uh, would mm -hmm. say that the Constitution is a divinely inspired document. Yep. And it's not. <laughs> no, it's so not. The Mormons are explicit about that. that they actually do believe the American Constitution and founding document are part of revolution. Mm -hmm. That kind of deification of rationalism, but also, that was also a French revolutionary idea too, which was directly inspired by the American Revolution. <laughs> Yeah. So then we then we get to Pennsylvania, and it's the same kind of deal. Um, William Penn founded Pennsylvania on religious liberty. Uh, he saw what what Rhode Island was about, and uh, I think I think they were both in this direction. But William Penn was very explicit that he still wanted a a Christian society, but he just didn't define what doctrine, you know, what denomination that would be. But he he still envisioned that Pennsylvania would be a Christian state. Um, but because of these of these religious uh, liberty prescriptions in, in the actual founding documents of the colonies, like you know, at the time the culture was was homogeneously still Christian despite the denominations. But you know, once you have that those those seeds of pluralism essentially, then where do you draw the line? Because then it just continues when you have immigration and you have other religious sects come in that are completely non-Christian. Um, then it just continues to the point where it's like, well, there's no line. So. Um, so yeah, you had the New England Puritans, you had Rhode Island separatists, which essentially wanted to be completely separate from the Anglican Church. 
um, as opposed to just reforming it. Uh, then you had the Pennsylvania pacifists, which, which are basically Anabaptists, the Mennonites, the Amish, those, those types, Quakers. Um, and so basically, you know, they were all different groups kind of putting their flags in all these different territories and stuff. But they didn't know how to deal with the Catholics coming over to try to start uh, Maryland. And so um, while they were, I mean, the, at least Rhode Island, Pennsylvania promoted religious liberty, um, they didn't like the idea of Catholics coming in and, and setting up a Catholic state in Maryland. And so uh, the, the toleration of, of Catholics in, in Northern Virginia, Maryland was very like rough <laughs> to say the least because they didn't, they didn't want to give them the religious liberty to, to flourish. But then those were also the seeds that were bearing fruit at the time. So, um, you know, Maryland was kind of an intersection between the Anglicans from the South, the Puritans from the North, and then the Catholics coming over from the Old World. So, you know, it was this kind of uh, hodgepodge of, of things in one place, and it caused um, caused what was called the Protestant Revolution, <laughs> or the Coos Rebellion, which was actually like an armed conflict um, of 700 Puritans that attacked Catholic um, Catholic army, and, and so it actually led to kind of a, a bloody uh, skirmish, you might say. But um, and and then the laws kept changing. They kept changing from tolerance. No, we want to tolerate Catholics. We don't want to tolerate Catholics. We'll tolerate them, but not let them be in public office. So it was it was that whole question. And then you know, how do you expand the the definition of Christianity now to okay, well. You have the non-Catholics and the Catholics, um, but I think then then they felt the need to well, Thank you we have to somehow define Christianity, and that was fundamentally the problem because where do the boundaries lie? Where, where what is the framework um, to define that? And I think that was what they were what they were dealing with. Um, <clears throat> then I discussed um, the Carolinas. There was a what was called the Carey's Rebellion, also a, a violent skirmish that took place. Uh, you had the dynamics between the Anglicans and the Quakers, and also the whole, again, the whole repeating the process of, of vying for political power and passing laws and getting governors in there to, to um, defend your, your church. And so it, that, was, that was also um, a tension that took place that led to violent uh, a violent incident, and this this one was interesting too because I didn't mention it, but I read that um, these toleration acts were also in promotion of of just political and economic stability, so that they could continue on with their commerce and and not have to deal with these religious questions, but that they could agree to disagree and just just focus on on commerce and building up their economy, and and that was kind of a driving force for, for putting differences aside. Um, Georgia mostly founded by Anglicans, but then um, they excluded Catholics. <laughs> um, and then Anglicans in, in Virginia. Uh, Virginia was the, was the first colony, and in, in, in 1619 they, they uh, established Anglicanism as the state church. And so that had been the state church for probably the, well, the longest period of time, from 1619 to... I think 1786. Um, so that was very um, that was a, that was a pretty long time of habit promoting Anglicanism in this in this state, um, and it was really the efforts of, as I mentioned before, Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. So they had slightly different approaches to how to <clears throat> establish, like officially through the legal system, how to establish religious liberty. Um, but essentially, James Madison was the one that was able to push it through, and you know they looked at different models and, and what they meant. Because again, as I said, t tolerance was one thing, neutrality was another thing. So, so what they were going for was that the, the state or the government would not have any say, any promotion into any religious affairs. And so what that did was delegate religion essentially to the, to the private sphere of life. You could believe what you want to in, in the privacy of your own home, you could practice the way you want to, but the government will not support, you know, 
promote or discriminate one way or another. Um, which, you know, kind of was born out of necessity because of, of all of the conflict that was happening at the time. But living in, in, to, in the 21st century today, we see that religious liberty means that, you know, Satanists and Wiccans and all of them can have essentially equal footing in the eyes of the government as, uh, as Christians. On page four, you're sort of skipping ahead there when you attribute that to the First Amendment. Of course, that's ultimately what it turned into. But originally, the idea was that because you had established churches in several states, you didn't want to have a national church that would displace those. You know, like you notice, like uh, Massachusetts had established congregations in 1833. That was long after the First Amendment. Yes. Yeah. And so the First Amendment didn't didn't relegate religion to the private sphere. The Fourteenth Amendment. Did. Yeah. No, you have, you have the First Amendment on board page. But the 14th, but what you're yeah. talking about is the 14th Amendment yeah. was yeah. applied to the states, <clears throat> which is which is really interesting because yeah. because the First Amendment was was saying that the federal government could not establish a religion, but the right. state governments could. Right. right. Um, yeah. And so so what changed was was the 14th Amendment. And of course, by the time the 14th was adopted, no state had had a yeah. state religion for decades. Yeah, but but that is interesting because. Um, I think somewhere, like, the Massachusetts Congregational Church was lasted far beyond even yes. when the First Amendment was, mm -hmm. was yeah, in effect. Yeah. yeah. Well, by the way, they not only uh, um, expelled Ann Hutchinson, they, they hanged four Quakers, too. Um, they were what they call the Boston Martyrs. Uh, they, they were, they, they, there were others, but they simply beat out of the, they whipped out of the uh, Commonwealth from town to town out until they were out of the colony, but there were four Quakers that were hanged for, for being expelled and then coming back again. And they finally said, okay, enough of this. Yeah. So, so much for, for religious toleration. Well, you know, the Puritans weren't all bad. <laughs> no? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, as I had mentioned, by the time the First Amendment you know, they, they passed it in Virginia, then they passed it, the First Amendment. And <clears throat> again, at the time, like, it was, it was, it didn't have, I mean, it had initial Jewish settlements and stuff, but, but nothing major. And so all of these uh, principles would extend to other religions um, that were non-Christian. And actually, I forget which founder it was, but they actually said that that was, they, they understood that to be the case. Like, they were not opposed to having... Muslim, freedom for Muslims, Jews, and they even said atheists and pagans. So I forget which founder said that, but might have been Jefferson. Might have been Jefferson, yeah. and, but the fact that he was cognizant of that at the time, you know, should. Sounds like something else. Yeah. Yeah. He was a bit of a nut. <clears throat> mm -hmm. um, so then I then I talk about the. Uh, well, you had that going on, and then you had the. The first, what was called the first Great Awakening. Um, I don't know what page that was on, but did you want to explain? Okay. Four. Four? Okay. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Just, just that there were some key characteristics that we can kind of see today, but. Um, you know, there are a few charismatic leaders uh, that, that you might have heard of, George Whitefield, John Wesley, Jonathan Edwards, but basically their, their preachings were, you know, kind of going around the country um, and having this kind of proselytism kind of uh, approach to, to things and also trying to revive, like, the low church attendance that was taking place. And so they were trying to kind of energize people to go start church attendance and all of this and and what was born out of this was kind of this new um uh these new approaches to christianity that they, that became normative and so i give some examples traveling preachers tent meetings overseas missions um new denominations and a, and a kind of evangelical movement um a shift towards extemporaneous preaching you know from from formal liturgy to just kind of winging it um, personal conversion as a new birth experience, um, enthusiastic conviction, and absolute assurance of salvation. So these were some of the things that were being promoted to kind of 
transcend denominational lines and kind of form a kind of uh, broad approach to Christianity that all denominations could kind of embrace. Um, and so we, we see hints of that already, or to this day, from, from those, those influences. Um, then I talk about the Second Great Awakening. It was a little bit less emotional, but still considered to be um, a way of diluting denominational barriers. Um, it was more egalitarian in its approach, so it was very much involved and focused on like uh, giving women the right to vote and female empowerment, and then also um, uh, ending slavery, which were all good things, but they were social movements that basically took the place of a, a religious unity to kind of a social unity um, that all that all Christians could kind of basically hop on board with because they were they were trying to promote these these um, new social movements. Um, <clears throat> Salvation became very individualistic and um, could be done as a personal decision, uh, what I call decisionalism. So they kind of, the First Amendment was still Calvinist based. It had a lot of presuppositions of Calvinism. And then within Protestant um, theology, you know, you have the, the, the dichotomy or the conflict between the Calvinists and the Arminians. So, so things started shifting a little bit toward the Arminian side, which was a little less predestination, more and more like, well, anyone could be saved, and you can be saved by your own decision if you believe these things, etc. Um, this was also the time period in the early, well, in the 1800s, that new religious sects began to emerge that were outside of the bounds of Trinitarian Christianity. So you get Unitarianism, Mormonism, and Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, so that was really, that really came out of the second great awakening. So you kind of can see where that spirituality led to too much freedom in the sense of people just really going off, off the rocker and, and doing their own thing. So um, <clears throat> I talk about Mormonism. It started in Western New York by Joseph Smith, who basically claimed he had these visions and talked to angels and found these golden tablets, which is the Book of Mormon. Um, <clears throat> but it wasn't very welcomed, and so the Mormons basically went on their, their long journey to Utah, but they, they had a few stops on the way. So they went to Ohio first, um, and then they thought Missouri would actually be the place to, to establish American Zion, which would be the, the colonized Mormon society. And so when they went there, um, they weren't very welcomed by the, the establishment, uh, the, the political and social establishment, and Basically, the, the Mormon views and the non-Mormon views could not, um, were not compatible uh, religiously or politically. And so that broke out in um, the 1838 Mormon War, which I, I was very surprised about. Because again, like we don't, we're not told that there are these like actually violent um, uh, interactions between these religious groups. But I don't have the estimate of how many people died, but people died. So, so this, and, and the governor at the time actually wrote a, a mandate saying that we need to get rid of Mormons and, or execute them. So it was pretty severe. And so it was really their, their effort to try to push them out, which, you know. What was his reason for that? Like, what was the, why did they hate Mormons? They could not see eye to eye. Um, like, just, I think Mormons, uh, Wanted to be polygamous, have polygamous marriages. That was, that was, that was key. Key. I mean, Americans can tolerate all sorts of heresy, but polygamy, that's really pushing <laughs> Yeah, because I mean, that was still what they were doing. Wasn't that why Joseph Smith well, got killed in the first place? He was killed by a mob of people who were angry about this polygamy. Yeah, well, somebody, somebody once said, they said, well, his problem was he raped one too many farmers' daughters. Oh. Really? <laughs> So that's why. <laughs> they couldn't get along. So it wasn't like non Trinitarianism, it was just polygamy. Just, yeah. Well, I mean, that might have had something to do with it. Like, well, you know, you're not even in the bounds of, of a, a, Prot a Protestant idea of Trinitarianism. But I think those social interactions of, of having multiple wives and trying to set up a, a stable society and all that kind of yeah. thing, including, including the youth and stuff, you know, I, I just. I don't. I, I haven't gone into depth 
on each of these topics, but I think it would be interesting to get into and see like what specifically, yeah. you know, caused the... Well, you have, you have to keep in mind too, each one of these, with the exception of maybe the Anabaptists, each one of these movements has its root in another movement. Mm -hmm. Mormonism doesn't really, it, yeah. it just kind of happens. Um, in fact, the Mormons today will probably even tell you, you know, they're, they're the referring to the early church. Well, actually, they invented their version of the early church, but it, it's, it's, um, it's not a continuation of any other tradition. It's uniquely American. Isn't it distinctly Mace? It's Masonic, too. Yeah. It, it's and largely Masonic in origin. And the other thing, too, all these groups that complain about being oppressed by another established group are themselves aspiring to become an established oppressor group. <laughs> what the Mormons did yeah. when they got to Utah and basically set up a theocracy there that they ran, and even, like, there was a bunch, you, you, you ever heard of the Mount Meadows Massacre? Yeah. Where mm -hmm. they, they slaughtered, like, what, a hundred and something people, men, women, and children, because of some something that happened to some Mormons back in Arkansas somewhere, you know they're you know you know it, it's one thing to say religious freedom for me until I get religious freedom and then can dominate you and you don't you don't get it exactly and that's I'm not mistaken I think Joseph Smith was booted out of the more but around the uh, Masons oh yeah yeah and he actually joined another church after he started getting the revelation but then he got booted out there. Yeah, this, but it, it's quite interesting, this, this uh, Second Great Awakening that uh, started in the, what, about 1830s, 1840s. Mm -hmm. uh, you had the Millerites, um, uh, and they set a, a date like 1842 for the Second Coming, and, it, and everybody was out, on the, out in the field on the hill, hill, hilltop <laughs> waiting, you know, to, and great disappointment nothing <laughs> happened <laughs> so their leaders moved the date back and they were all out on the hilltops waiting to be taken up and nothing happened but somehow it uh, it all it turned into um on one hand i think it turned into the seventh day adventists it also turned into into the into the uh jehovah's witnesses there's there's some kind of common there's some common root in that the immediate Successors of the Seventh Day Adventists. Right. And I think actually Miller, after the two two false stars, said, oh, "I guess I was wrong. He gave up on the whole thing because some of his disciples didn't." Hmm. <clears throat> hmm. <clears throat> so yeah, I that's the, but that's basically Jim. What I was trying to capture is that all of these groups essentially, when they they're competing for political power, they get political power, and then they they're absolutely intolerance anyone else and then that starts a new group and then a new schism and then they go find territory until until there's no more territory left um and so it's just a cycle but then then the things start to shift where you know people are saying well what what unites us what makes us you know christian have a christian identity to begin with and so then you get these kind of social movements and missionary movements that seek to rebuild kind of a, a unity, but not based on anything theological as much as uh, a common social purpose. Um, so, so I kind of recap on page six, kind of the, the, the um, 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries, as we just discussed, and then touching on the 20th century, um, <coughs> I just kind of defer to some of the some of the fathers in the Orthodox Church that have kind of looked at this from an American perspective. Um, I mentioned Father Sarah from Rose, Father Peter Hears, and Father Spirit on Bailey, all of who have really taken a look at, especially the 20th century, um, the influence of Eastern religions and mysticism and New Age ideas, um, <clears throat> uh, the missionary societies. You know, basically Christians going overseas and immigrant or indigenous population saying, well, which version of Christianity do you want us to convert to? Um, and they were all, you know, different at the time. And so um, that basically led to a reductionism where, you know, you have these essential truths and that's what makes you Christian. Um, and so it kind of forced, especially in the World, World Council of Churches, setting that up, kind of a creed unto itself, saying, you know, these are the core features that makes us have a Christian, a single Christian identity. 
Um, and so I mentioned at the bottom of page uh, seven, beginning of page eight, um, kind of this uh, like kind of, kind of creed almost that, that the World Council of Churches has. And it, it's, it's very uh, strange to us because it mentions things that the Orthodox Church already believes itself to have. So a common calling, a visible unity, one faith, one Eucharistic fellowship, a common life in Christ. Uh, all of these things that already exist in the Orthodox Church, but yet this is, these are the kind of key words, the key ideals that the World Council of Churches um, is, is moving toward and promoting. Which begs the question, why is the Orthodox Church a member of the World Council of exactly. Churches? Exactly. And I think almost all of the Orthodox Churches are, except for Bulgaria, I think, for that. Well, I, it's a it's a long it's a long history. Um, the World Council of Churches was very useful to the Orthodox Church, um, uh, the Old World Churches in particular, um, during the uh, Soviet era, uh, because it allowed the a context for the or created a context for the some of the leaders of those churches to come to the West and tell other Christians what was going on in their countries. To in other words, for the Russian bishops and Ukrainian and Serbian and so forth to come and and, and tell the leaders of the church in the uh, churches in the West that they were being persecuted, um, and so this actually uh, was a very um, important thing because as then uh, the churches in the West would lobby um, these uh, uh, these co the communist governments to let let these people go. And so it enabled the, uh, the churches in, uh, in the old world to, to get some measure of um, uh, freedom and accountability, um, uh, call, or calling their governments to accountability. Um, that, you know, unfortunately it all got mixed in with uh, uh, all sorts of socialist agendas, um, starting in the, well probably, well actually probably from the very beginning. Um, and. Uh, uh, particularly in the 60s and the 70s. And uh, of course, once the Soviet Union fell, it, it kind of lost, or once Soviet power, communist power fell, it, it kind of lost a lot of its uh, uh, meaning. And, and, um, but, uh, so it's kind of a shadow of what it, what it was. But it still has, um, it's still, it, it played a fairly big role in the history of Orthodoxy in America, but, um, but uh, uh, it's a, uh, the ecumenical movement is, is, I think, proven more problematic than it has anything else. Yeah, so then um, Father Spirit on Bailey, he basically, if anyone's read his uh, Orthodoxy in the Re Orthodoxy and the Kingdom of Satan, I think it is. Um, he talks about some of the institutional, he, he builds off of Father Seraphim Rhodes, but he talks more about the institutional mechanisms that promote these, these more ecumenical type uh, <clears throat> ideas and, and sense of unity among Christian groups. Um, the United Nations being a big one in their, their agencies, but um, just globalism in general and, and various institutions within within society that um, seek to promote these these ideas. Um, and then I just like briefly speculate on the 21st century asking the question, well, what is this gonna bring? Uh, we already see the rise of mega churches, um, personality TV shows, you know, Christian organizations, um, or channels, uh, and non-denominationalism, which is now a big thing because that gives people a sense of, well, I'm not, I'm not a sect, I'm not a, there's not a, divide, a source of division, you know, I'm, I'm a non-denominational. Um, and so I just kind of briefly talk about that. And then there's this new movement now too that's being discussed, which is called the Emergent Church. And um, it's, it's been really difficult. I've done some research on it, but it's been very difficult to kind of define because it doesn't, it doesn't define itself. It just says basically, <coughs> Like we're still we're we're a church that's still emerging and in transformation to some unknown identity that we don't know yet. Um, 
Sorry. It kind of dwindled down a little bit. Uh, it seems. The emerging church folk. It seems like they've dwindled down a little bit. It's, it seems like that because there's there's no. Yeah. They all wrote as much as they could. And we don't care. <laughs> Brian Zahn, um, Brian McLaren, Shen Claiborne, Rob Bell, those types. Yeah, I don't, I don't recognize those names. Yeah, they're not worth. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a, it's, it's in a broad kind of in the that broader uh, evangelical community. But is it more evangelical or more mainstream? Oh, evangelical. Okay, so yeah. it's like liberal evangelicals. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm an expert from uh, Orthodoxy and Christian in North America and uh, how kind of the um, Native people within Alaska were treated. Um, with the sale of Alaska to the United States in 1867, however, the future of the Alaskan mission seemed far less secure in the eyes of New American authorities. The Orthodox mission was unwelcome relic of Alaska's past. In open cooperation with proselytizing Protestant missionary groups, the new territorial government launched a campaign to Americanize the Orthodox Native people. Orthodox prayers, icons, and native language were forbidden in new American schools and denounced from the new Protestant pulpits. Repeated protest, uh, protests by the Orthodox bishops to the present Congress and military occupations, uh, military occupation authorities were ignored. Yep. When, when was what period of time was that? This was eight, 1867. Onwards, interesting. Up until Alaskan statehood, for example, huh. um, the Presbyterian Church was. Uh, authorized and uh, funded by the U.S. government to convert Orthodox um, uh, to Presbyterianism. Um, they created schools uh, um, and the children were pulled out of their villages, uh, some um, without any, without permission from their parents. Um, they were put in these schools, they were forbidden to speak their native languages, um, they were tortured, they were raped, and they were uh, abused. Um, and, uh, uh, and and the the U.S. government uh, did its best to destroy Native American culture. So basically, you're, you're Christian, but you're not our type of Christian. So you got to become our type of Christian. That's right. Yeah. We we'll go so, back to Christianity and in the, in the national state church. You know, that's the new religion. Yeah. Is whatever the state tells you. Yeah, it's called socialism. Yeah. 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 One, I think one thing that's really What's really interesting is to look at this radical cultural shift. Um, because before 1700, there was no, the concept of separation between church and state, um, the concept that the church and state could be separate, could be separate, was unthinkable. Um, and it was uh, because you had this, you know, this, this ancient notion um, uh, that uh, you have a single society, it may have it, it has it has leadership, but the whole society uh, belongs to the one church, one one church, one emperor, <laughs> one hierarchy, um, one religion, um, and you know so there was and, and even even in Protestantism early on, uh, that's what the Treaty of Westphalia was about, um, where. The religion of the prince becomes the religion of the people. So, if the prince is a Catholic, the people in his in his county, and if these were really counties, were Catholic. If he became a Lutheran, they became Lutheran. If he became a Calvinist, they became Calvinist. Um, you didn't have religious pluralism. You had. Um, uh, it's not like in America where you can go and drive down one street and there'll be 20 churches of different denominations. Uh, there would only be one kind of church in any given area. Now, there may be many parishes of that church, of that, you know, of the Catholic Church or the Orthodox Church or the Lutheran Church or, or whatever, but um, uh, there was no such thing as choosing your own up in, uh, at first, up until the Reformation, uh, both in the Orthodox East and in the Catholic West, um, the church and the society and the, the, there was no nation state, and the empire uh, were one thing, it was a single entity with different aspects. Um, yeah. Well, that's one of the paradoxes of what you were just discussing about Alaska and so forth, is that despite all of this First Amendment and Masonic influence, et cetera, et cetera, 
the extent to which the United States was functionally a very Protestant society until the middle of the 20th century, yeah. and that, you know, we can't have a Catholic president, that would be wrong. I mean, or, or you like, we conquer the Philippines and we try to impose, you know, Protestantism on the Philippines. I mean, you know, so, I mean there was, even with an out of established church, there's still a sense that America is a Protestant country. Uh, no particular denomination may be established, but we're Protestant, we're not Catholic, we're not anything else. And that was expected, I mean, that was the American norm. Under the guise of religious freedom. Under the religion, guise of religious freedom. Right. Yeah. And including things like you're talking about in Alaska. Right. Uh, you know, we, I think we lose sight of that, because we hear all this talk about all these deists and masons and people that started America, which is true, but there's also just a huge uh, popular Protestant uh, prevalence in the country in those days. Well, there was, yeah. You know, right now, what's interesting is most of the Protestant denominations have died. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, there's there's one hundredth or one tenth anyway, or less than um, of the number of people in Protestant churches than there was, say, 50 years ago. Um, uh, instead, what? No, and that's what I was going to. And and so what's. What's supplanted a lot of Protestantism is evangelicalism. There's also been a huge growth in the, in the Catholic Church. There's been a uh, substantial growth in the Orthodox Church. But, you know, statistically, it's, it's, not, as, it's not, as, not as large, but it's still pretty, for us, it's pretty substantial, you know. Um, uh, as, you know, as we've got converts who have poured into the Orthodox Church. Uh, and the same in the, in the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, both Orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism have at their root um, this unitary vision of the church and society. And Has there really been that much growth? In the, I, know, I know some people, especially disaffected Protestants, convert to Catholicism. They, they seem to have lost a lot of people in the years too. Well, they say that the largest denomination in the country is ex-Catholics. Yeah. Um, uh, but well, they don't lose on top of Yeah, they lose them to the to no religion. Yeah. But a lot of them are from the orthodoxy, or at least looking into it, especially with the Vatican II stuff that he mandated. Yeah. But you know, the other, the other, I think the other thing that's really interesting and important is, while on on one hand this new religion of uh, this new civil religion of um, of American society is, um, uh, is secularism, mm -hmm. and it is a religion. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that didn't really exist up until 150 years ago. It was, there was no such thing as secularism. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there was a secular, a secularizing movement mm -hmm. And Protestantism, you know, from the time of the Reformation on, was a secularizing movement because it uh, it began to break down that that relationship between the society uh, and the church uh, by creating by by breaking down the unity of the Roman Catholic Church in the West. Um, but uh, but in, instead of uh, completely breaking it down immediately, what it did was it it's, it broke it into into different denominations, because essentially all the Roman, all of all of the Protestant churches are types of Roman Catholicism, mm -hmm. from our perspective. Um, uh, and uh, but that that unitary vision is, is, I think, is very important, and that's why, for example, in Orthodoxy, uh, so many people uh, talk about being monarchists. Because a monarch, monarchism represents represents that that unified vision of 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 the church and state uh, together, a unified vision of society. Um, well, of course, we're getting that in the form of secularism, which is really, as you say, its own religious content. Right. Which is becoming increasingly obligatory on everybody. Right. No matter what religion you don't really belong to. Right, and so, and so instead we have a totalitarian dictator who um, demands uh, our allegiance. Ironically, the United States presidents today have 
much more executive authority than George the Third ever did. Yeah. Oh yeah. Couldn't dream of having. George III well, look. <laughs> well, look at look at our current one. He's been in office what a month, and his uh, he's he's already got three times the number of executive orders that yeah. the previous one did. Yeah. And George III had nothing to do with the revolution. No, no. He just got blamed for everything. I don't know. I think the founding fathers could look ahead and see what their family was going to drop. They would have repented and begged George III for forgiveness. <laughs> Not Jefferson. Except for maybe Jefferson. During the Lakers. Ben Franklin. Yeah. He was a gentleman. Like turkeys. Not sales. Turkeys. Oh. Well, that's pretty much that. about it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no final <laughs> summary? <laughs> <laughs> I know so funny. Uh, no, so I, I mean, I link this a little bit to, again, ecumenism and then. Somebody's scared. <laughs> and then, um, you know, making making the guess that well, if if that jump wasn't so difficult, then the jump from you know Christianity to this kind of amalgamation amalgamation of other uh, world religions wouldn't be so difficult either. And all of the kind of globalized institutions that are already starting to move in that direction, and I mentioned one in particular, uh, the Congress of Leaders of World Religions. Uh, worlds and traditional religions, they're already kind of setting the stage where, you know, they're talking about religious extremism and conflict and how do we resolve this and how do we move to more peaceful dialogues and, again, kind of uh, paralleling that with, you know, what, what the um, uh, stages were in colonial America. So it's more of my speculation, but it's kind of, you can kind of see parallels um, in that. And then, um, yeah, just talking a little bit about how this non-denominational movement kind of leads everyone to uh, their own imagination about what Christianity is. And that was really my own experience, like, before coming to Orthodoxy. It was like, I don't know what they're even teaching. So um, it was really just, it, it's so blurry and vague that it leads everyone to kind of, kind of come up with their own conclusions. Um, that was, that was my experience at least. And then, um, yeah, so in conclusion, I was kind of uh, getting back to the title as well as to what Roger Williams was kind of discussing between truth and peace. I mean, are we really, are we really aiming for truth as the end, end in and of itself? Or is this kind of a chiliastic, you know, let's make our kingdom on earth and um, let's agree to disagree so that we can have peace, so that we can have commerce and political and, and economic stability um, at the expense of at the expense of truth. So. about uh, Ian Hutchinson and her opposition to congregationalist polity and the sola scriptura um, of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. But my, uh, just a quick question, like uh, what were her influences? What, what was her background? Why was she opposing those things? Um, I wrote those things down on a separate <laughs> paper that I didn't bring, but her father was a, a Puritan um, pastor or preacher, I think. Um, and then there was this, this movement that she was influenced under, I think, this guy named John Cotton, who was an antinomian, which was um, basically trying to make a dichotomy between the covenant of works and the cover, covenant of grace. And so she was very um, compelled by this idea of like 
absolutely free grace and there's there's no works involved there's no moral code it was basically antinomianism was like anti any sort of legalistic or um, moral code or anything like that that you were saved and so there was no need to be even responsible like, respond yeah <laughs> yeah like there was no moral authority that you needed to adhere to because once you were saved there was no free grace meant that you, that was it you didn't need to do anything else for your salvation which um, goes along with the whole Calvinist idea that uh, once you uh, if, if you were uh, predestined for salvation uh, you, and you, you can't lose your salvation and you can't resist the grace of God and so uh, uh, you're saved whether you want it or not or you're damned whether you want it or not yeah, so I, th I think the Puritans had still some kind of sense of puritanical like moral expectations that moralism that they expected people to have and she was like didn't even want that <laughs> and then um, and the point you were making um, there was um, was it that basically they're still uh, at this point enforcing the beliefs like the congregationalism and stuff um, or what was remind me again, what, uh, what was your conclusion from that well, I think it, it was it was part and parcel of this whole this whole strand, this historical strand of, of a revolutionary spirit against the previous you know established order, saying, well, we don't want to adhere to your rules, your rituals, your formal way of doing things, and so we're going to create our own thing, and then that just kind of played itself out throughout history, even including today. So I think that was kind of the starting point for me because that was the earliest controversy that I could find. I'm sure there are probably others, but. Um, at least it was the most well known. That was that was one of the first. So. Gotcha. <laughs> so. Well, okay. Thank you very much. Great paper. Who's next? <laughs> you said quite a stand.